Hi, and happy Sabbath. We are thrilled that you have decided to accompany us as we delve into scripture and hopefully extract some useful insights for your life in this place and in this time. Now, in a beautiful country in the world, the first country that has adopted Christendom as its national religion, some wonderful things are occurring amidst the small and fledgling Adventist community there. So why don't you follow me, pa pack a bag, and let's go to Armenia to see what God is doing there. The Caucasus region in Euro-Asia has a rich history. Armenia was the first country to adopt Christianity as its official religion. Although this country was reached by Christianity long ago, the Adventist Church only has a small presence here. To continue church growth, Global Mission has focused on unentered areas in this region. Through urban centers of influence, Global Mission pioneers, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, people are learning and accepting the Adventist message. Church plants, like this one in Armenia, have blessed those searching for hope. Years ago, Albert felt completely lost as her daughter lay in a hospital bed. She had fallen off a high wall, and the doctors weren't optimistic about her recovery. Before this happened, Albert had just started studying the Bible with a Seventh-day Adventist. This new friend came to the hospital regularly to pray with Albert. The windows of the hospital were open, and I was screaming, begging God to help my daughter. A miracle happened. God heard my prayer. Alvard's daughter made a full recovery, and Alvard knew that God had healed her. It was such a relief, and she wanted to visit the church where her Adventist friend worshipped. She felt right at home, and now her young granddaughter comes too. I always wanted to have God's love in me, to treat people like God treats people. I've seen many great works that God fulfilled in my life. Global Mission pioneers are frontline workers who truly invest in their communities. And Hof Hans is no exception. He shares the love of Jesus with many people in their town. People like Nune and her family came to this church because of Hof Hans. They have been coming for three months and have dedicated their hearts to Jesus. I would like to ask everyone to pray so many more people can join our church and that we can all be in God's kingdom when he comes to take us home. Please pray that people throughout Euro-Asia will come to know Jesus through creative and holistic ministries. Pray that God will continue to show His love through the work of Global Mission pioneers. Thank you for supporting Global Mission. Incredible, isn't it? To think that God can move in places as far removed as Armenia or as close as Loma Linda. Now, as we said, we are continuing our lesson study on the book of Isaiah. But as we do every weekend, we would be remiss if we enter into this dialogue without elevating a word of prayer. So why don't you join me? Our God, we would ask that you stay in our midst we would ask that you speak, speak through us. And as you participate and partake in this conversation, we plead that the musings of our mind 
be useful as somebody seeks a relationship with you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Now, I must begin with a confession, and it's one that I'm not proud of. For a few years now, I've tried, sometimes with more success than others, to change my dietary habits. Maybe it's the fact that I'm getting old or that our staff here at the church continues to hire younger and younger pastors. But for about three years, I've been engaged, engaged in this relentless battle against attrition, against aging. And so as a result, I've dedicated myself to a exercise routine, and I've also changed what I eat. Now, I must admit that I don't miss that many things that I used to consume, save for one. Chocolate. And not just any chocolate. A bar that seems to have been created and crafted in the very depths of the heavenly city. Oh, to taste it is to taste grace and all the deliciousness that the world has to offer. Now, the name of the candy bar, in case you are wanting to flood my office with them, is whatchamacallit. And I've had a rather strange relationship with this candy bar throughout my life. For you see, when I was around eight years old, I went to the grocery store with my mother. And while she wasn't looking, I lifted two whatchamacallit bars. I placed them in my pocket and then covered up my pockets with my hands and we walked out of the grocery store. It wasn't until we were in the car that she saw me reaching deep in there to unearth my buried treasures. As I peeled the wrapper, she wondered where that had come from. She asked and I casually told her that I had picked this up from the grocery store. Well, if your mother was like mine, you know what comes next. She slammed on the brakes, engaged in a reckless driving maneuver, otherwise known as a U-turn, and we headed back to the grocery store, half-eaten, whatchamacallit, bar in hand. I was given the exact amount of money to pay for the two bars, and then I had to confess, to confess to stealing them. Not only was it very embarrassing to walk up to the cash register, hand the crumple up the bills, and admit that I had stolen something. It was even more painful when my mother informed me that I would not be getting an allowance for the next two months. And it was at that time that I, as I was asking the question of why, she answered, Loving son, I am disciplining you today so that the world doesn't have to discipline you tomorrow. Now, my mother's attempt at discipline stems, stems from an entrenched concept that we have in the Western world, namely the idea of justice. Now, this concept of fairness that has come down to us from Roman jurisprudence states that we ought to engage in retributive relationships with people. In other words, justice as its primary objective has retribution. Now, I wonder how this connects with divine notions of justice. Maybe that's what the author of the book of Hebrews has in mind when he writes that while Abel's blood cries vengeance, Christ's blood calls just, cries mercy. And this idea of justice that is sprinkled across the Old Testament reaches its apex in a liturgy. A three-part sermon that Isaiah delivers as he begins to draw his narrative to a close. If you have a Bible, I'd like you to open it with me to Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah 59 is, as Gerhard von Rod, the famed Old Testament scholar, notes, a liturgical 
series that stems from a community in lament. And we've answered why. We know why they, are, why, why they are lamenting. For they have returned to Jerusalem, but they are still afflicted. Exile and the return home hasn't delivered all the promises that they had in mind. And the idea still rages in their minds and their hearts, well, what about divine justice? And does divine justice equate to retribution? I talk about justice because the noun mishpat, which can be translated as either justice or judgment, is present an astounding amount of times throughout the three parts of the sermon. Whether it's in its direct form or in its hiffel or as connected in a nominal form with a verb, the verb tzedek. And so Isaiah begins to develop his sermon, a sermon that deals with justice and is trying to uncover what people need in order to connect with the God whose blood cries mercy. Now, let us begin by entering into the introduction as Isaiah develops his message. Verse 1 simply reads, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. And so at the very outset, what Isaiah is trying to do is he's trying to inform his audience that there experience of injustice is, and their experience of dreams not quite being fulfilled is not a direct result of God's inability to do and provide what they need. The reason why things haven't gone as well for these returned exiles as they had hoped is because their iniquities, as verse 2 tell us, have been have separated them from God. There, it is their sins that have driven this wedge between God and the people. It is not that God is turning his back on his beloved nation. And this is why tragedy has befallen them. Rather, it is that people continue to seek a life apart from God. Another Old Testament scholar, Klaus Vesterman, notes that the first piece of this particular sermon can be described as a confrontation. A confrontation between a God whose blood continues to cry mercy and people whose ideals of justice too often devolve into revenge and vengeance. I want you to pay close attention Close attention to what Isaiah will read and will attempt to have his people understand in verse 3. He says, Your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt, your lips have spoken falsely, and your tongue mutters wicked things. No one calls for justice. No one pleads a case for integrity. They rely on empty arguments. They utter lies. They conceive trouble and give birth to evil. Now, what we have here, what at least Isaiah is attempting to describe, is a systemic failure on Jerusalem's part to enact mishpat, to enact justice. Their courtrooms are corrupt. Their laws... Their laws shake, quiver, and tremble at the power and might of those citizens that have more. Their lives, their lives now have become a constant race, a search for wealth and position. And in this society, justice cannot flourish. Now, the temptation is there. It's always there. To talk about our notions of ethics as private. To remove faith from the public sphere. 
to make it a matter between God and myself. And while faith is deeply personal, Isaiah seems to be pointing us to the fact that it is never private. While faith remains something that we deal with in the comfort of our homes, the results of faith, the results of faith may be experienced throughout the marketplace of life. Faith is personal, but it is never private. It manages to be intimate while at the same time always being inclusive. So to ask the question of how well a society does with mishpat, one ought not only to look at churches. One needs to begin to analyze and examine the systems of jurisprudence in the land, the courts. And the courts in Israel? Well, the courts in Israel have become corrupt. Now, here's what's deeply painful. That this confrontation between God and his people stems from their inability to live up to the systems of governance that God had preordained for them. Systems that were based on ensuring the common good for four particular groups of people, the poor, the widows, the orphans, the resident aliens throughout the Old Testament. These were the people that needed to experience mishpat and tzedakah more than anyone else. Justice, mercy, and righteousness. Because if nobody spoke to them, their words, their voices would remain unheard. And this past summer, this past summer in our country, we experienced, we experienced people, people who felt so frustrated, so frustrated with being unheard that they took to the streets. On both sides of the aisle, on both sides of the aisle, of the aisle people felt that the systems of governance did not provide them with a seat at the table. Well, this cannot be in the economy of Christ's kingdom. So he is seeking to give voice to the voiceless by ensuring that those of us who have a platform are able to speak up. Now, you might be wondering, how do we end confrontation? How do we correct these issues of justice? How do we promote equality? Isn't justice ultimately about retribution? And it seems, it seems that the God whose blood cries mercy would say, no, justice is about restoration. It's not about seeking equal punishment. It's about demanding equity. Notice what the seer will write in verse 8, he says, The way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their paths. They have turned them into crooked roads. No one who walks along them will know peace. The idea of roads in the Old Testament is deeply related to their conception of ethics. In other words, the way in which the ethic dialogue and discourse in Jerusalem is being had is not one that is conducive to promoting justice. They are economic inequalities that must be addressed. Now I know, I know that often talking like this makes us nervous. But it is only in the light of these open conversations that we can finally finally find echo in the words of Isaiah as he pens in the ninth verse. Justice is far from us and righteousness does not lead, reach us. We look for light, but all is darkness for brightness. But we walk in deep shadows. It's this 
bleak panorama of what is occurring in a society that has forgotten about justice as redemptive, justice as restorative, justice as striving for equity. Now, you might be asking, in Isaiah's sermon, what happens after confrontation? After confrontation between God and a people who have forgotten justice? Well, what happens after confrontation is confession. For our offenses, verse 12, are many in your sight, and our sins testify against us, and we acknowledge our iniquities. The way to diffuse confrontation with the divine is to engage in confession. And notice that throughout the second part of the sermon, Isaiah will, will speak at least until the end of the confessional piece in the plural. It is the whole nation, the whole city of Jerusalem, recognizing its collective mistakes as they have fallen short of God's ideals for justice. It isn't only recognizing my shortcomings. It is bearing the brunt of responsibility for a society that has made God's path crooked. Ah, one of the moments that I felt the most pride to work and participate as a member of this staff was when our senior pastor, when our senior pastor confessed, along with all of our church, to not doing enough in some of the areas of justice and equity. And it's not because our leader, a deeply spiritual man, had any personal failures. It is because he recognizes the same thing that Isaiah did all those centuries ago, namely, that confession must be communal to move on from confrontation. Our North American division, our North American division is also attempting, attempting to comment on the mistakes of the past by collectively confessing that sometimes we could have done more. We could have done more to straighten out the paths that society has deemed crooked. It's a beautiful picture, a beautiful picture of a society that no longer seeks to point the finger at a particular group and vilify said group and complain to said group for all the ills that assail us. Rather, it is the recognition that we all bear corporate responsibility. And so we confess. But Isaiah is not done yet. For confession, without part three of his sermon, typically leads to, as one of my colleagues on staff would say, to self-flagellation. Confession needs something more. And what that is, is consecration. Notice. Notice how Isaiah begins to draw his sermon to a close. He says, from the West, from the West people will fear the name of the Lord. And from the rising sun, they will revere his glory, for he will come like a pent-up flood. That breath of the Lord drives along, the Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord, my spirit who is on you will not depart, and my words that I have put in your mouth will always be on your lips, on the lips of your children and on your descendants from this time and forever. So arise, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Confession is always followed by consecration. And what is consecration if not a commitment to do better? if not a commitment to connect with other people's stories, if not a commitment to hear and participate in other people's perspectives. And so Isaiah, Isaiah reminds his people that the journey with Yahweh is complex, 
It requires sometimes confrontation. It moves us hopefully into confession in order to transform us and consecrate us. But throughout that journey, the one, the one constant is that God is a God of redemptive justice. God is a God of restorative justice. God is a God that is seeking equity. And he is inviting you today to go and do likewise. Joey, we are almost done with our trimester and our quarter studies. And today, uh, Isaiah gives us a sermon, a sermon that deals primarily with justice and the experiences of people in exile and as they return to exile. This idea that justice can be something that the whole world strives for and that the God of Israel will be the God, the God of the whole world. Yeah, it's a, it's a powerful message that God is, like you said, a God of justice and his justice is meant to be redemptive and restorative in that journey. And it's sort of the way that your mo mother worked with you. I love that statement that she made that I'm disciplining you now so that the world doesn't have to discipline you later. Um, the whole way that she approached that that um, that whatchamacallit incident, if you mm. want to call it that. You know, I've never tried a whatchamacallit before. Is it really that oh good? Oh my gosh, it is delicious. <laughs> and here's why. Um, I know that I know that as Adventists, we believe in the self in the health message. So those of you who are militant about that, you might want to cover your ears. But it's because it is this wonderful mix of sweetness mm. and just textures. So a whatchamacallit bar is caramel. It's got uh, chocolate, but it's got like these crispy um, grains that that make it a that make a delicious crunch every time you you mm. put it in your mouth. So it's it's a it truly is an experience that engages all senses. That's funny when when you said whatchamacallit, it it kind of reminded me of manna, right? Because manna is what is it? So <laughs> <laughs> so maybe maybe whatchamacallit is uh, the secret recipe for God's manna. Oh, you know what? That I think I think that is the most profound theological statement that either of us <laughs> is going to make today. Yeah, but I, I just love how your mother approached that 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 incident. It wasn't just, like you said, um, self-flagellation, mm -hmm. but it was an opportunity for you to learn and grow, to move you through confrontation to confession to to consecration, where you actually had to the step and step in and make things right again. That was so beautiful. Yeah, Joey. So as we've been talking about. Uh, this this word mishpat in Hebrew has so many possible uh, translations. Um, it is to stand for that which is right. Mm. It is to engage in justice or to practice justice. It is also to participate in judgment. Mm. And I think that that judgment piece is the piece of confrontation. It's the, it's the moment when you are sent back to the cash register and have to admit your mistake. But a lot of the times when it comes to God, we never move past the confrontational stage. We never move past the judgment stage. We forget that judgment is a part of God's mercy. Mm. Why do you think it is uh, that we are so reticent to talk about judgment in Christian conversations today? That's a deep, that's a, that's a deep question, but so it probably has a lot of answers. The thing that immediately came to my mind is how much I personally don't like confrontation mm. in my life. I mean, confrontation is uncomfortable, right? It means pointing out faults, which I think in our society, we've, we've sometimes shied away from pointing out faults in others because it feels like you know, we're judging them and that's not something we're supposed to be doing. If there is a virtue right now in our society that's above all others, and it's that virtue of tolerance, mm -hmm. right? And uh, judgment almost seems the opposite of tolerance. It seems to be being intolerant mm -hmm. of other people. And so uh, I myself sometimes shy away from that when really, if you think about it, Pointing out faults, if done in a loving manner, if done, if done in a restorative manner, 
is actually a great gift that we can give to others because it's kind of like it's kind of like having something stuck in your teeth. I don't mm. know if that's ever happened to you, Miguel. All but... the time. <laughs> yeah, that happens to me all the time. And it, there are people I see, they have something stuck in their teeth and everybody else sees it, but that person is unaware, right? And so the most generous thing that we can do in that moment is just to take them quietly aside and, and point out, say, you know, you have something in your teeth, you might want to pick it out. I mean, that's, that's not, it's, it's judgment. Yes, you're telling them that there is a flaw in their appearance, but it is also extremely beneficial. It's much better than just ignoring it and then everybody is aware of this problem that that person is unaware of themselves. And it's also better than just mocking them in public and calling them out and say, hey, look, you know, Miguel has something in his teeth. He has some spinach. Isn't that hilarious? I mean, it's to just quietly take them aside and actually do that confrontation can be a great gift. I don't know. What do you think? That's Miguel? that's powerful. See, that's why I don't need spinach. I eat whatchamacallit bars. <laughs> um, but you know what? Yeah, Joey, I, I once read that the way in which you engage uh, in justice and in judgment that is honoring and that seeks to make you a better person is that you comment on things that people can change, mm -hmm. right? Um, so like your example of the piece of food in, in my in my teeth, that's something that I can easily that I can that I can change. There are some some other things uh, that are part and parcel of who I am. And so um, there are the, these things that I that I have no control over changing, it's it's probably best uh, not to comment on. Um, uh, uh, but alongside this idea of being honest and open is also this idea of accountability. Mm. Um, with, uh, with the conversations that we have in, in Christian circles, uh, there seems to be a ever shrinking space for Christian accountability. Mm. And if we've read and learned anything about the fall of many a popular religious leader um, in our time is that because they were so central to the ministry, mm -hmm. a system of accountability couldn't be created in which they could be taken to task for some failures that probably could have not only protected them, but protected the people of, uh, around them. So is there a, a difference and how do you differentiate Christian accountability from being uh, piously judgmental, which I'm sure none of our friends want to be. Yeah. Uh, what you said about accountability is so true. I think the more important people perceive others to be, the more leeway they're given. And I'm not sure if that's always healthy. It puts you in a place where you are not accountable to others. And we all need accountability because we're all sinners. And so we need people helping us to be aware of the blind spots that we have in our own lives. I think the difference comes between pious, um, pious judgmentalism and, and, and Christian accountability. I think the difference comes in this idea of love, mm -hmm. right? Because pious judgmentalism is all about pointing out people's flaws for my own pleasure or my own benefit. Whereas Christian accountability is all about pointing out flaws so that you can help them to grow. So it's out of love for, for others. Uh, there is a book called Radical Cr Candor written by Kim Scott, and she's not a Christian, or I don't know whether she's a Christian or not. This is not a Christian book, but she talks about when we challenge people, we should follow two principles, which is to care personally and challenge directly. Mm. Care personally and challenge directly. And that's that idea of love. You can't really challenge someone in a constructive way um, if, you're, if you don't really care about them. You have to, to, in order for that challenge or that candor to be most effective, it has to come from a place of caring for the other person, of, of, of loving them and wanting what's best for them and not just pointing it out for mm. the sake of pointing it out. I think that's, a, that's such a helpful distinction, particularly as we talk about these ideas of justice. I remember reading a Christian theologian and ethicist, Karen LeBox, and um, looking at, at the concept of justice, she, she argues for six primary theories of justice that function under uh, 
three primary principles. Uh, the first one being uh, justice as retributive. And so it's, it's our kind of legal system that says for each mistake that you make, uh, there needs to be punishment that fits the crime. Mm. And so a lot of the times it's very difficult to distinguish uh, retributive uh, justice from, I guess, our penchant for looking at to get even. LeBox then says that sometimes we have justice as distributive. In other words, you get out of the system what you put in. And if, if any one of us has ever benefited, uh, particularly during this pandemic, from, from unemployment benefits or any of our views are collecting uh, social security, this is this idea of justice as distributive. Mm -hmm. But it seems, at least in LeBox's mind, that God's justice or, or the justice that is present in scripture focuses on a different principle. And so she calls it uh, justice as redemptive. And, mm. and that principle behind that is that to each what one's most basic need is. And I think when answering the question, what my most basic need is, is exactly what you're talking about. It is being in relationships that are undergirded by love. And if that's the case, then redemptive justice necessitates that you challenge me directly and that you that that it you move with openness and candor as as you were mentioning. So in the end, Joey, uh, at least in uh, the pericope that we were looking at today, uh, Isaiah 59 and 60, the idea of justice is that, is that it, or mishpat in, in the Hebrew, is that it leads us to another place. And the place that we are led to, at least if we are to read Isaiah correctly, is shalom or peace. Mm -hmm. What does the pursuit of justice have to do with peace in your mind? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times when we think of peace, we think of the absence of conflict, mm, right? Mm. Peace as being where there is no conflict. And yet scripture, when it uses that word shalom, it seems to be more inclusive than that. It's it's bigger than that. It has, it has to do with wholeness or completeness mm -hmm. where everything in the world is as it should be. Mm -hmm. You know, there's only a few moments in my life where I could say, oh, I, I experienced shalom. Like in that one moment, I, I like things were as they should be, right? Everything in my personal circle was right. Um, whether it, it was, you know, the the marriage that I had when I the, my wedding day with my wife when we said our vows, um, the birth of my children, these these very short moments. Uh, I, I remember a time when I was on a mission trip, um, and we were just the whole group was unified in this service of, of, of um, underserved um, people. And that moment right there, when we were just all in sync, that seemed like a shalom moment. But those moments are not constant, at least on this earth. And they're not pervasive. They, mm -hmm. They're limited to personal experiences. And so when, when, when we talk about justice, justice is about making things right, right? So you could define it as, bringing peace. Justice mm. is about bringing shalom to the world. It's, a, it's about moving the world to completeness and wholeness and what it should be, what God envisioned it to be when he first created this world before sin entered it and destroyed it. So that could be a connection between justice and shalom. I, I think you just hit it on the head with this, uh, uh, this realization of peace as holistic. Um, in, in the Hebrew, uh, the, you're absolutely right in noting that it is much more encompassing than simply the experience of, of absence of conflict. Um, the idea of shalom as, as a place and a, a moment where everything is as it should be or everything is balanced. And if you think about sin and about injustice as some uh, 
20th century theologians have uh, done some really interesting work uh, connecting those two concepts. If mm -hmm. you think about sin, it's always about trying to shift the, the power dynamics, about mm -hmm. trying, to, trying to create inequality, whether that be social or spiritual or relational. Um, it's all about trying to shift the balance of power. And so I think that the primary purpose of justice in the Old Testament isn't punitive. The primary purpose of justice is to return us to an equilibrium, as you were mentioning, and that's why it happened openly. It happened in the gates of the city so that everybody could see that these relationships that sin had thrown off of the ba off of balance were now being set again into e equilibrium through shalom, through this pursuit of radical, candid justice that seeks to be redemptive and leads us to peace. Yeah, you know, what you're saying right now reminds me of, I don't know who said, I think it was John Ortberg who talked about how, why the prophets were so cranky. And he said, the prophets are cranky because they're sort of like, um, they're sort of like people with perfect pitch living in a world in a tone deaf world mm -hmm. right where they they know they have a vision of what life should be like and when everywhere they look it's all wrong and no wonder they're cranky because everything is like broken and wrong and so they they cry out these words of justice and and if you look at if you look at the prophets, like you said, it's all about bringing that equality of power, equality to this world. And Jesus seems to follow along those themes at, when he comes because he talks about blessed are the peacemakers, right? The, those who bring peace. Um, Paul talks about us engaging in the ministry of reconciliation. So really, all of us who follow Christ, we are following in the footsteps of these prophets, prophets like Isaiah, who see brokenness in this world and are called by God to, to bring about a better, a better state. Yeah, that's, I think that's so well put. Um, as you know, we've, we've been quoting him a lot, but as Heschel says in that seminal work entitled The Prophets, to us the plight of the poor is a nuisance to the prophet. Mm -hmm. It is, an, it is a very threat to existence. Wow. And it's because they recognize, uh, cranky and all, that, that God is a God that is seeking, after all, equilibrium. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why Isaiah um, resists the, the urge to privatize faith. Uh, mm -hmm. to make faith uh, an issue that only occurs in the church. And he, he actually says that, that our faith, our belief, our pursuit of justice ought to pervade uh, the systems and the institutions, not only in the church, but out in the world. Um, that I know for is, is a tricky uh, line to walk, particularly as we are heirs of this wonderful uh, history that seeks to create very, very clear distinctions between uh, religion and politics, or the state and religion, or the state and, or religion and faith and the systems. How can I walk that line while at the same time honoring this prophetic call to recognize uh, that faith is always personal, but it's never private. Mm. I loved what you said about confession being communal. I think that speaks to what we're talking about right now is this idea that I identify um, with not just my sin and not just my own failures, but also with the failures that we have as a community. And part of our community is a nation, right? Um, there, There is sometimes a tendency for us to say, you know, I'm an American, but I'm not that kind of American, mm -hmm. right? There's a psychological or sociological term called corfing, right? Um, cutting off reflected failure. And what it, what it says is in order to preserve my own self-esteem, I distance myself from those that I consider as being failures. And, and we'll do that. We'll, we'll corf from, like you said, we'll see the poor as a nuisance because they, they lower my sense of self if they, I identify with them. And yet what God seems to call us to and what the prophets seem to call us to is this idea of corporate ownership and corporate ownership of the entire community and saying, you know what? 
we all have flaws, but I am still an American just like the Democrat is an American and the Republican is an American and um, the homeless person is an American and, 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 and the Hollywood socialite is an American. I, I am still an American. I'm still a part of this community. And even larger than that, I'm a, I, I'm a child of God just like every single one of them is a child of God and that, that, that identification. So I think it starts from realizing that who I am as a child of God um, informs everything or should inform everything I do, including the way I vote, including the way that I interact. Doesn't mean that I have to press or legislate my morals on other people, but it does say that how I see the world and who I am as a person does influence the way that I'm, I, I bring about justice in this world. And part of the tools that we use to bring about justice is, is by participating in government. Hmm. So one of the beauties about confession, at least about communal confession, is that it opens a space for conversation. When I hmm. cease blaming uh, those to whom ideologically or religiously I'm opposed to, once I cease blaming them for the ills uh, that assail our nation or our church or our family or whatever the group you might be looking at, it's much easier to have a conversation. And I found uh, just this week, as, as I thought about th these concepts of, of communal confession and justice, I found that the best pieces of American history in the past century, the things that I'm most proud of, or things that were led and spearheaded by people of faith, mm. people of faith for whom the call of scripture compelled them to go out. Yes. And whether it be uh, boycotting buses in the South or um, decrying the evils of uh, unregulated markets or uh, mass uh, weaponization in uh, in our armies etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. it's all these these ideals and ideas that call us to be the best version of ourselves are always led by people of faith mm. so Joey I don't think what you've said and it's certainly not what I'm saying is we're going to tell you or go to church to learn how you ought to vote mm. no. what we are calling you to do is to have the way that you understand scripture inform every other decision that you make and then then vote your conscience um, and be and vote it with some boldness so we we have this moment of confrontation joey then we have this moment of corporate or communal confession mm. but we don't want to stay in the confessional piece uh, Merlin Baton, who's one of the foremost uh, biographers of Martin Luther, noted that Luther would spend around eight hours in the confessional, and that didn't produce any peace. So while there is something freeing about confession in the, in the sense that it opens up a space for conversation, we can't stay there. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I think Isaiah is so powerful in the sense that it, he moves us to consecration. Mm -hmm. What does a justice-seeking, consecrated community look like? Wow. When it's fully consecrated, when it's fully justice-seeking, I think it, it continues to try to follow in the footsteps of Christ. I, in this way, it seems when I read through um, Isaiah uh, 59, in the very first two verses that you read, um, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Mm. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he, he will not hear. And he can, goes on to say that um, because of this state, because of the state of separateness from God, because our sin ha sins have really separated us from God because sin, like you talked about, 
um, is bringing about this inequality and imbalance and a brokenness in this world that is so antithetical to who God is, even when we seek for justice. I mean, there is, according to verse eight, there's no justice in their paths. But even when we seek for justice, we're like blind, like the blind, we grope against the wall, feeling our way like men without eyes. Um, we search for light, but we cannot find it. But all we have is darkness for brightness, but we walk in deep shadows, right? So even it seems to suggest that even when we try to reach for justice, this brokenness, this brokenness prevents us from being able to complete it, to mm. bring about the justice that we so long for. So I think as a part of this idea of bringing about justice in the world, it, it all starts also with a transfer transformation in ourselves that we need to begin with making sure that we are in a daily transforming mm. relationship with God because we can't fix brokenness in the world unless God is fixing the brokenness Amen. in us and that's why it's so crucial that that relationship, this is not to say that you have to be perfect or everything inside of you has to be right before you do anything out in the world. But it does say that we need to be in that transformative relationship with God, that that has to inform all that we do. Unless that's happening, we're just gonna be breaking more things as we try to fix what's broken in the world around wow. us. Oh, that's powerfully said. We cannot go and fix what's broken in the world unless we allow God to fix what's broken in us. And I think the first step, my dear friend, for you to do that, as, as my colleague was mentioning, is to recognize that none of the systems and institutions that we can create can bring about shalom. Mm. Not our political systems, not our economic systems, not our systems of jurisprudence, because our systems are ultimately broken for they are created by broken people. Yeah. And so I think it's, it's particularly poignant in Isaiah that it is ultimately God who brings forth shalom. Mm. Um, and that the invitation for us is simply to participate and to come together with what God is already doing. And the best way in which you can do that is, as, as Joey was saying, to come alongside God mm -hmm. and allow God to transform you. Joey, any last words for, for our viewers today as, as we close this, I think, rich conversation on, on ideas of justice? I just come back to those three C words that you, that you emphasize at the end, the idea of um, confrontation confession and consecration. That really is the journey that all of us need to engage in daily with ourselves, personally, also with, with, with those around us, but especially with ourselves, the confrontation of our own sin, the conviction of our own sin, confession of it, and then a consecration where God can move us to something better. That's beautifully said. Well, Joey, um, would you close us as you do every week in prayer? Let us bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for being a God who loves us so much that you did not leave us wallowing in our sin and unaware even of our sin, but you came not only to convict us and to lead us into confession, but also to empower us to live a new life, to be renewed by you. And so we ask that daily, we enter into this relationship where you are growing us inside out so that we can continue your work of justice and reconciliation and restoration in the world around us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So our dear friends, may God shine his face upon you and give you peace until next time. Mm -hmm.